good a talk of the session. Um, this is from uh, Peter Cock, uh, and I'm just looking for, uh, I should just read the title from your uh, Peter Cock with uh, his team from the University of Sheffield, Optimal Quantum Metrology of Distant Black Bodies. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for uh, the invitation. It's always a pleasure to, to be back in Bristol. I used to live here, and uh, you know, the weather is great. Uh, so yeah, this, this work is um, uh, done mostly by uh, my former postdoc, Mark Pierce, and uh, Earl Campbell, also a Bristol uh, graduate, uh, alumni, alumnus. Uh, he's in uh, Sheffield now, he's an Abstract Fellow, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in Sheffield. This work was uh, funded by the Communications Hub. It has a lot to do with communication. Um, but anyway, uh, good science is good science, I think. And so, uh, so, there you go. Um, yeah, so the idea is that we want to uh, be able to do it, um, you know, teles uh, telescopy. Uh, we want to know, we want to look at distant objects and basically see what they look like um, for astronomy reasons or for other reasons. And um, depending on the audience, right, uh, I show one or the other, or in this case both. And um, we want to do that as, um, uh, as accurate and precise as possible. But when you're dealing with, uh, you know, particularly uh, astronomical objects, you can't really do much uh, in terms of sending out uh, quantum light and, and try and get some quantum light back. Maybe with uh, with with uh, military applications a bit more, but that's not what this talk is about. So I'm really talking about we get some classical light, well, classical uh, thermal light uh, coming into my detection system, and I want to know what is the best I can do um, to to you know see what it looks like. So I'm going to first uh, tell you a few things uh, about quantum metrology. Uh, there's um, so I'm going to give you an overview. Uh, with a lot of, um, there are a lot of equations uh, on the screen. Um, there are more there to show that we actually did work. And um, uh, it, so, don't worry too much about the contents. Uh, it's more the sort of the overall structure. So we call that proof by intimidation. Um, so then uh, I will uh, look at two spatial modes because I'm a theorist and, uh, and two is already uh, uh, hard enough. And uh, and we want to look at what kind of shapes can you see. And then finally, I'm going to uh, tell you what are the optimal measurements uh, for this kind of system and, and then generalize. So uh, in any measurement device, you can, uh, you can think of it as uh, a th three-part process. So we can uh, prepare a system, a probe system, let's say, in some kind of quantum state, probe north, and we evolve it, and then we put some, uh, some parameter on the state. So, um, and this can be multiple parameters. And then we do some kind of detection, and then typically, when you're doing precision measurements, there's also a feedback loop. And all this uh, can be sort of captured in, uh, in the theory of uh, metrology. Um, and, uh, and so what you want when you do a, a, any measurement, but particularly a precision measurement, um, you want to measure uh, the, the size of theta, right? Whatever this is, it could be a phase, it could be anything. Then, you have a probability distribution of your measurement outcomes, and uh, that should change uh, as theta changes. Because if it doesn't, you're not really uh, seeing anything. Then you basically have a stopped clock if theta is time. So, um, so we want uh, we want that, and then of course you have a probability uh, space simplex, and uh, you you are looking at movement through the probability simplex. And the faster your probability distri distribution moves along sort of uh, uh, lines of um, increasing theta, the better, your, your, the more precise your measurement is. And so we can define a distance along the path theta and ask how many times do I need to measure, how many times do I need to sample in order to be able to tell the difference between probability p and probability q. And so you can see you get these kinds of uncertainty regions along your path. Okay, now we're talking about distance in a space, but this is a highly uh, curved space, very much like uh, this Escher drawing. So if I go back, you, um, you have um, a really sort of scrunched up uh, uh, distance at the edges 
because if one of your probabilities is zero, then you can uh, gain certainty in a single shot measurement. Uh, if you, for example, uh, if I have red, green, and blue marbles in a vase, if, I, if one of my probability distributions you know, is on this edge, and I draw a red marble, then I know instantly and cert with certainty that I have my other uh, probability distribution. So it kind of makes sense. Now, if I uh, work out what is the statistical distance in this space, you can see that it has uh, this funny uh, thing here, uh, nu numerator. So this looks a little bit like what you've, uh, you're used to from special relativity, you know, your invariant distance, but now you have this uh, one over the probabilities and these can go to zero, in which case this thing blows up, as you can just see. And the threshold for distinguishing two probability distributions is then like, the, uh, like a small uh, distance in this space, not infinitesimal, and uh, you multiply that by the number of times that you uh, sample, and if that's greater than one, then we say now it's distinguishable. And of course, this is not a hard uh, limit, it's, uh, it's, it's a rule of thumb. Um, and the Fisher information, uh, can now be defined as the ds d theta, so the distance along uh, this path squared, so it's a velocity squared in this space. And um, you can in, uh, interpret this as the amount of information that you get in each uh, sample on average. Okay, so now there is a difference between uh, the normal Fisher information as the sort of path through your probability space and the quantum Fisher information. So the uh, classical Fisher information, the normal Fisher information, is basically you get a probability distribution because of this whole system here, but you do a measurement, so you end up with a classical uh, set of data, and you calculate your Fisher information uh, from that data, and that gives you a number. But you can do any measurement you like here, and uh, if you uh, do the optimal measurement, then you get the maximum amount of classical uh, Fisher information, and that is called the quantum Fisher information. But because it's, uh, it, it, de it determines a particular measurement, uh, that is in some sense equivalent in saying that the quantum Fisher information depends really only on the state. Okay, and then you have to also wor worry about what, uh, what kind of measurement uh, do I need to do in order to actually get that Fisher information, and that is going to be uh, the topic of the second last part of this talk. Um, but the important thing now is that we can use both the, the normal Fisher information and the quantum Fisher information um, in both classical experiments and quantum experiments. So, um, uh, so uh, and this is what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, classical light and I'm going to look for the quantum Fisher information because that is going to tell me how much information I can get at most. Right? And so, um, so then uh, we have the classical Fisher information. If you sort of do the, all the calculations, you see it is a derivative of uh, the probability distribution. Well, it's the square, really. Uh, if you have um, uh, theta here now is a uh, vector, so it's, it's like um, uh, this becomes a matrix, but it's not really important right now. Uh, but it's basically your probability distribution. Take a derivative, and you can calculate it. Um, oops, uh, and well, there you go. So both at once. So the quantum Fisher information uh, is basically the optimized Fisher information. So it has to depend on the density matrix, the quantum state. And because we don't have a probability distribution, because we haven't measured. And so we need some kind of uh, derivative operators. Here we have straight up derivatives, but we now need derivative operators. And these are called uh, the symmetric logarithmic derivatives. These are these L's. And so we plug in uh, rho, the, the quantum state, and we take the trace, and we have uh, L here, and then we get the quantum Fisher information. And you don't need to worry about the details, just that L is uh, typically pretty tricky to find because we don't have a very nice uh, equation for L. This is an implicit definition, so you know that keeps me in a job, I guess. Um, so, uh, so that's uh, what we're going to play with. So we have the, uh, the quantum Fisher information, and then we have a classical Fisher information that uh, tells you, once you do a particular measurement, how far, uh, how close are you to the quantum Fisher information. So now I'm going to consider um, optimal measurements of black body radiation. So um, 
I had the uh, equations for the classical and the quantum fissure information. Uh, here is the uh, quantum fissure information for Gaussian light. And of course, black body radiation is also a form of Gaussian light. And um, now here we have uh, an expression, again, um, you know, fairly intimidating. Uh, the important thing is that we have an expression for the quantum fish information, and we have an expression for L, the symmetric logarithmic derivative. And even more important is that it depends on sigma, right? M here depends on only on sigma. Omega is a uh, symplectic uh, matrix. It's uh, you know zeros and ones and minus ones, so very well known. Um, so we, we know this M, and you see here we have uh, only sigma goes into this. So what is this sigma? It's the covariance matrix of the state. And when you have a, uh, a, 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 a thermal state, then uh, the covariance matrix is uh, completely completely determines uh, your state. So essentially, this is effectively our state. And so now what we want to do is we have some kind of black body of a particular shape and we want to go and do some measurement. Now if this is a star, we're only going to capture a teeny fraction of the light that's coming off the star. So we now have to define the, uh, the mode volume of our detector, or the efficient mo uh, eff effective mode volume. So A is the area of the detector, whereas tau is the, the, the time of, uh, of, of the detection. And uh, so we're going to grab um, a bunch of photons. This should be single mode, because if it's multi-mode, we're going to get, um, well, it gets more complicated. But uh, so for now, we treat this as a single mode. And so we're just looking at uh, numbers of photons in there. So you can have also frequency filter and look at a single frequency, or you can look at all frequencies, but then you have multiple modes in this, uh, multiple frequency modes in a single spatial mode. Um, but uh, so what we have is this volume, and that is uh, what is going to define uh, what state we're looking at. Um, so, um, no, that's one thing, but now we're going to have to do two, because with one uh, single spatial mode, you cannot uh, do any imaging. Right? So we need to have at least two. So, okay, so I put two of these guys, put them a certain distance apart, and uh, I can calculate, well, my postdoc, uh, could calculate the, uh, I can probably do it too, but he, uh, he calculated this, um, is the covariance matrix, right? So, and this is the sigma that we plug into all the previous equations, right? And, um, and um, that doesn't matter what they look like, we can do it, it's, uh, it's, and it's not so, uh, not so difficult. And so here we have the average photon number, and here we have these Bs here, our, uh, our, our coherences between the two modes, because this, this here is essentially one, uh, one mode, and because you have an, uh, an, uh, two potatures for each mode, and same here for the second mode, and you see that these Bs are the, are the coherences between the, the two, and you get coherences because you're looking at something far away. And uh, so the Bs are really where it's at, because uh, B is uh, related to uh, the complex degree of coherence. And uh, we don't really talk about it that much in quantum uh, optics these days, but it's a, it is, of course, a really important concept. Um, because it tells you uh, everything you need to know about uh, spatial coherence. And uh, so that's what we want to know. Um, because there is the Van sittard zernike theorem, and uh, it relates the coherence in the image plane between two points uh, to the, uh, the Fourier transform of the source plane. So if I can uh, get the complex degree of coherence gamma between two points, and I can collect them from for many pairs of points. So now I'm already thinking CCD, right? Where I have many many pixels, uh, many cameras, uh, many detectors. Then uh, I can reverse this relationship, and I can extract the the source intensity, which means that I now make an image. And so, what do I want to do? I want to know these gammas as precisely as possible. So now I have a metrology problem. I need to measure gamma as precise as possible. But I have that in my uh, in the previous uh, theory that I just uh, expressed. So uh, I have three parameters of interest. Right? I have the total photon number in my two modes. I have a and phi, and A and phi are just the, the polar uh, uh, components of the complex degree of coherence. 
right? The phase and the and the magnitude. And um, so now I have three parameters, I need to find the optimal estimator of these uh, three parameters uh, in order to gain the spatial information about uh, the thing that I'm looking at. And which, with that, I can use all these pairs of, um, uh, so these, all these coherences for every pair of pixels and do reconstructive imaging. Okay, um, how much time do I have left? Okay, good, good. Um, so, uh, so I have, uh, so now I have to look at, okay, what are the optimal estimates? Because it's very nice. I have some theory, there's some, there's some, some formulas, uh, and uh, but then the question is, can can I actually uh, implement uh, an optimal measurement um, of uh, of a distant black body? And um, uh, because that still remains to be seen, because maybe these these M's or these these L's. Maybe they take on a horrific uh, shape, um, and it turns out that it's actually that's uh, luckily not the case. Um, however, there is a problem uh, because I have three parameters, and that, that means that I have three observables that I need to measure because each parameter has a, a, a different, potentially different, uh, optimal observable that ga gains the most information, and unfortunately. Uh, those three observables, these the three related to the SLDs, they do not commute, right? And we all know from uh, uh, our quantum mechanics uh, uh, course that if your observables do not commute, you, then you cannot measure them simultaneously without uh, paying the price in, uh, uh, in, in terms of noise. And noise is exactly what we want to um, uh, avoid here. However, there is a little technical uh, loophole here that if the commutator of two uh, SLDs, uh, if the expectation of that commutator vanishes, then uh, the SLDs are still uh, jointly measurable in a, uh, in a, in a um, if you take lots and lots of data. Um, so, uh, so when we work out the, uh, the SLDs, the symmetric logarithmic derivatives, uh, we find that they take a quadratic form. And, uh, and it takes the form in, uh, of this, so where we have, so J here runs through total photon number, uh, the magnitude of the uh, complex degree of coherence, and the phase <laughs> of the complex degree of coherence. And, uh, and so I have a, a P, a Q, a Q star, and an R, and, and their values are given down here. And uh, so they're fairly complicated expressions. And, uh, but the nice thing is that this is your total photon number, so A dagger A on mode 1 plus A dagger A on mode 2. And then we have some kind of, um, well this looks to the quantum optics people around here, uh, which is you know, most of you, uh, this looks like a beam splitter. Right? And then we have some, uh, some extra uh, you know, uh, business there. So this is great because we can actually implement this with linear optics. And so when we do that, uh, we basically have uh, our beam splitter uh, business. We can look at the difference between, uh, so we get a number here, the number of photons that you measure, and a number there. So we can take the sum, in which case we have the total photon number, and we can take the difference, and uh, then we get something else. But what is that something else? Well, we're going to have to put in a phase shift that depends on, um, uh, where, yeah, that depends on the exact uh, form of these P's and Q's and R's. And so when we do that, when we work out what kind of phase do we need to put there, uh, well, it is equal to the phase that we're trying to estimate. So that is no good because we don't know what phase we're trying to estimate. And, um, uh, and so normally you would say, okay, let's, uh, uh, let's do this in an adaptive setup. So we basically try something and it's like, well, it's roughly, the phase is roughly in this, this regime, this, this, this interval, and then you try to hone in on it. And uh, so that's how uh, you normally uh, get around this problem. Uh, but, uh, and this is a, uh, was an inspired um, uh, uh, trial from uh, Mark, uh, my postdoc, he said, well, let's just you know, scatter some random phases at the, uh, at the problem. So we basically just randomize, and then you sample the entire uh, space. Let's see, let's see how it, how it performs. <coughs> and, uh, and then when you, do, when you do that, you find that actually, uh, it is nearly optimal. And so what we have here on the vertical axis is the, the variance 
uh, of your um, uh, of your parameter, and so this is the optimal uh, variance divided by the the random phase uh, sort of induced variance, and you see it stays one for very long, and then ra ra around uh, 80 it really sort of uh, drops off a cliff. So, and this is A here. A runs between zero and one, and that's the the, the amount of correlation that is between your um, uh, your two pixels. So if your two pixels become too close and they start to become, uh, they start to sample the, almost the same mode, then uh, then you see that uh, that this uh, this doesn't work any uh, work uh, very well anymore. So you want pixels that are, you know, fairly far apart. Okay, so that is actually really good news because this is the sort of stuff that you can implement. Right? Being splitter, a random phase shift, that's that's doable. And uh, especially if you now compare this to um, uh, a Fourier uh, setup. So you fix the phase, you have a 50-50 beam splitter, and, uh, and now you're, um, you're, you essentially have a, a, a two-mode equivalence, equivalence of uh, lensing, so what, what, well, what I'm using right now. And um, so when you calculate the performance of that, so we, again we have the same because it's now a more complicated uh, shape. I have only this this ball here. Um, so we have um, uh, so the color here is um, is how well it's doing with respect to the uh, um, the optimal variance. And so uh, one is where you want it to be at. Uh, however, it is. 10 to the minus 3, and then it uh, goes up. So it goes up to 15, so let's say it's uh, 10 to the minus 2. That is far away from 1, right? So the randomized sampling of the, of the phase actually gives you something that's not only re uh, uh, close to optimal, but it does much, much better than uh, sort of what you could sort of uh, see as a generalized sort of normal uh, imaging with lenses. So. How should we image distant thermal bodies? Well, I pulled this off the internet, so I don't know what this is, but um, <laughs> I, I, I basically made, made, made up my own things. Right? So, uh, so the, here you would want to have something like that random, uh, random, phase, uh, random phase mask. Turns out, so I gave this talk, uh, or it's a, a, pre, a precursor of this talk, and I thought, oh, that's going to be the hardest thing. And like, no, that, that's what's called the stochastic light field modulator. So great. So it's all technology is already there. You, pro you need a lens because you need something like that um, acts like the beam splitter, and then you need uh, a CCD camera. And uh, you can't. You need an. Uh, we have an estimator that actually tells you. Um, so, so after you have the data, which you know is ample. Uh, you need a way to get that data into um, and, and turn that into an actual sort of estimate of your complex degree of coherence. And um, uh, for that, it is better if you have uh, not so much light. Right? So this <coughs> works very well for faint uh, uh, for faint objects, which is, I think, coming back to the very first slide with the tank, exactly what you were, or you know distant stars, um, exactly what you kind of want. So this is, uh, this is very, very promising. So um, in conclusion, I haven't really talked about Henry Brown and Twist, but it seems to come up a lot um, uh, when you talk to people about this, because we're doing really uh, like a multi-photon interference, uh, potentially multi-photon interference, um, uh, intensity interference. And that's, of course, uh, everybody thinks about Henry Brown and Twist when you when you put it that way, uh, but they in Henry Brown and Twist interference, you need to see two photons. But when you have a faint, uh, like in in a single mode or in two modes, but if you have a faint object, then you hardly ever get two photons in uh, in, in in a single mode. Um, so uh, so you have to throw a whole lot of uh, information away, namely everything that is the single photon uh, contribution. So Henry Brown and Twist, even though it was great. Um, uh, for getting the field off the ground, uh, if anything, uh, it's not optimal by a long shot. Um, we can do simple linear optical measurements. Uh, we can come very close to the optimal measurements, and um, uh, yeah, and, and t uh, you know the two-mode equivalent of a lens typically gives a very poor estimate. 
Um, and uh, with single photon resolution, you can get a lot of, uh, of information, and it doesn't even have to be completely single photon resolution, I think. Um, uh, and low light conditions uh, work very well. So, um, yes, and with that, I'd like to thank you very much. two mode case you need one phase to be optimal for the optimal projector but here in an SLM you've only got as many phases as you have modes so you get like to what extent if you did know the image can you optimally image it or might there be an optimal set of phases on that screen that is not optimal for any pair of modes but is only globally optimal Ooh, um, I'm Trying to parse your question, uh, <laughs> so I think it's. I think, yeah. I I'd like to talk to you afterwards about this because I don't think I can really answer it right now. Thanks. I have more questions. No, will man put you off? That's <laughs> a simple question. <laughs> Can you say so for an image that's got a uh, hundred pixels, you know, square? How long does the cl classical computation of the estimator take? Is it significant? Oh uh, yeah, no, it's it's it doesn't take that long uh, on a GPU, um, and it's. Uh, well, for we, we really only looked at two modes, right? Because we haven't really looked at, at a, like a full full image. Um, but um, yeah, you get uh, you get an estimate uh, an estimate uh, in, 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 in tens of seconds. Right? It's, it's really quite fast. But yeah, if you go for a for a full full uh, uh, image, then you have to look at you know pairwise, and that's going to be much higher. That take that's take, that take a long time. But um, you don't need to do this in real time, right? So, so if you uh, just want to take uh, an image, the image taking itself could be very, very fast, and then you just have to wait a little bit longer to uh, to get the image. Uh, it's a bit like you know old-fashioned photography. You take an image and you send it off to the 24-hour service. That's what that's what we want to bring back. <laughs> Hi. Um, so you mentioned Henry Brown twists, and they sort of famously um, looked at the angle that the star Sirius obtains. Yeah. Um, could you do that and sort of do that more precisely using these techniques? Yeah, it, sh it should be at least as good as Henry Brown Twist. Um, now, of course, Henry Brown Twist, they took a massive baseline, right? And uh, so that's uh, that's something that you uh, will, will come into. Uh, so that distance x, I didn't really talk about, but that comes into the spatial resolution. So if you do uh, if you do it with like a, a small camera and you, you point at Sirius, uh, then you're not going to get the same uh, uh, resolution. Uh, this is ju purely about the you know what you can do optimally given a particular uh, setup that includes that, that distance between the two modes. Hi Peter. Uh, I'm wondering. Can this kind of thing be applied to things like the SKA, so the square kilometer array of telescopes? I mean, here they're using phase alignment of everything in order to point things in different directions, I guess. Yeah. Um, so you need your beam splitter. Um, and so I don't know how you're going to do that. Um, I have something cool to build in space, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, so you need a beam splitter, you need a, you need a phase rotation. I, I think I've see some problems there, but maybe maybe that's not necessary, I don't know. Uh, maybe you can do things with collections into, and then do a beam splitter, but before you send it to uh, to, to actual detectors, but uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to think about, yeah. Uh, 
there have been telescopes that are sort of array telescopes and they try and get fiber connections to connect and do interferometry between the light collected here and here. Yeah. Uh, essentially to do the Hambry Brand twist. Yeah. 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 But any, any other questions from the audience? into a discussion with these people. So. <laughs> okay. Um, no, I think I think we should move on. We're doing, we're doing well for time. We're exactly on time, so I think we should thank Peter again. Thank you.